What's going on, everyone? Elliot here from Movie Files, and today is a very fun and special video. As a DC fan, we just had the release of Shazam! Theory of the Gods that came out over the weekend. You know, the box office isn't all that hot, but hey, I'm here to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything about the DCEU, and more particularly, as you all can see from the banner, we're going to be ranking all 13 DCEU projects from 2013's Man of Steel to the most recent Shazam! Theory of the Gods. So that is 13 films with that 10-year window, and just sticking to the films you know i won't be talking about the peacemakers of the world the doom patrol of the world i won't be talking about the else world films such as the joker and as well as the most recent the batman so we're just focusing on the dc extended universe which is led by as you all can see behind me the trinity of you know henry cavill superman ben affleck's batman and gal gadot's wonder woman so within that continuity within that universe is what we're covering today so before we get into my tier list do your boy a favor if you enjoyed today's commentary, enjoyed today's uh, ranking tier list, hit that thumbs up, share this video, and more importantly, leave your rankings in the comments below. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get things going and rank some of these good films, great films, not so great films, and some not so good movies in general, some pretty bad stuff here, but we're going to get into it. But I wanted to start off with what started all, right? So that's 2013's man of steel directed by the one and only Zack snyder man where do we begin so first and foremost i think the best way to begin is just where do i rank this film just to get this let's knock this out of the way man that's right that's right can y'all see that yes that's an s tier that is the top of the food chain in my opinion Listen, I can go on and on and on about this film, but just starting from a technical perspective, and this is this is I'm gonna have a lot of hot takes for you all today, but from a technical perspective, I think this is one of the best made superhero movies of all time. That's right. The way Zack Snyder created this world, the way that they were able to piece this film together from a technical standpoint, from a visual standpoint, some of the best action you'll probably see in a superhero movie with Zod versus Kal-El and Smallville and Metropolis, some of the best soundtracks and scores you're here for a superhero film like man is still hans zimmer who's the goat in my opinion no disrespect to john williams and a lot of the other great composers throughout the you know uh, hundreds and, and millions of films we've gotten throughout the uh the years of cinema but Hans Zimmer is the goat to me, and Man of Steel's score is just so inspirational. It's so motivating. It's also so epic in so many different ways. So from a technical standpoint, this film is beautiful to look at. And listen, again, I'm a DC fan, but I can acknowledge the shortcomings. I know that Superman is a very pivotal character. He's one of the most recognizable heroes of all time across all the world. And I know a lot of biggest the issues for some people is that's not my Superman, which I understand that. And factually speaking, it isn't your Superman, right? It's Zack Snyder's version of this character. And growing up as a kid, I'm a big Batman fan, but I respected Superman, but I was never a big Superman fan. So when it came to switching up somewhat of the mythology and the lore and the personality of Kal-El and Clark Kent, I enjoyed that interpretation from the, and again, I know this isn't for everyone, but the groundedness and the reality of a Kryptonian alien coming to earth it wouldn't be all saving cats in the trees and the boy scout ways it would be a lot of pushback from society and from humanity and i love how zack snyder put a lens to that side of the story and just seeing again going back to just things i love about this film i think about one of the best openings of a superhero film of films in general is that kryptonian fight when we're on krypton and we're seeing the end of the world and we're seeing zod trying to stop all this i mean it's just such a beautiful opening to the film, assess the tone, assess the, you know, the themes of the film of just trying to fight for what you believe in and fight for continuing on your legacy. I love that. And then just piecing out how Zack Snyder lets us know the, the Clark Kent in society and having the flashbacks of how, how he was raised by Jonathan Kent, which I know, again, another hot take, the tornado scene, how he raised him to, you know, not be the hero that we've known of Superman or Clark Clinton B, but I kind of like what they were doing there. And, you know, I just love a lot of the story building. And again, from an action standpoint, man, when you get Zod, who I'm going to put it out there right now, the best DC villain of all time, at least in the DCEU. I love what Michael Shannon brought to him. I will find him, Laura. I love him so much. And I can't wait to see him in the flash. But again, from a villain standpoint, a narrative standpoint, I just really love this movie on so many different levels. And again, I can acknowledge the decision of Superman killing Zod at the end, but I ask you, what would you have done if you were Superman in that moment? And not Superman of five years, 10 years, 20 years of veteran in the, you know, the, uh, the outfit there. 
but Clark Kent was over Superman for like less than a couple days, right? So, and, and Zod told him, if you do not kill me, Kal-El, I will destroy every single human on Earth. So <sighs> the decision had to be made. But anyway, we can have a discussion about this film for, for hours, but it is an S tier to me. It is the one of the best made superhero films, like I mentioned, of all time. The score, the technical achievements. There are some shortcomings. There are some decisions that are, you know, are questionable for sure. But I just really love what Zack Snyder did to try to launch the DCEU. So for that, uh, Man of Steel coming in at my S tier. And again, when we get to the ranking part, you all will find out where that film lands on that list. So next on the agenda was 2016. We move a couple years later, three years to be exact. And, um, you know, that is BVS. Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Now, let me take y'all in the time machine for a second here. If y'all, and this has nothing to do with the actual making of the film or as far as like the final product, but y'all remember that trailer of BVS? In particularly Comic Con, was it 2014 Comic Con or 2015 Comic Con? Oh my gosh. That trailer and the whole setup of Zack Snyder with the, with the Batman overshadowing the Superman logo was just some of the best marketing and leading up to the film was some of the best marketing, minus the last trailer, which we won't talk about when they revealed Wonder Woman, who was one of the best aspects of that movie. But the marketing, the hype, I, don't, I, don't, I can honestly say Infinity War and Endgame's up there. But as far as me, again, being a DC fan, I don't know if I've ever been more excited for a movie. I'm going to be referring to the Snyder cut of the um, this film because, if I'm being honest with you, the theatrical cut is not a well-put-together film, and we know why because things were taken out of context. There were scenes that were kind of removed from the film. So I, I will be referring to the – I should have put, probably put it in a little – title there but this is referring to the Zack Snyder's version of BVS which I think is just his version of kind of Man of Steel meets Batman versus Superman meets the Watchmen right because there is a groundedness to the societal conversation at hand again the continuation from Man of Steel what would a world be like if Superman was in it and what if he can't save everyone what if he makes mistakes what if he's blamed for killing people overseas and things of that nature so I love how Zack Again, put the groundedness in, in kind of a, again, not reality because we don't have superheroes in our real world, but just if in an else world, what if scenario, I love how those pieces of the puzzle were put together. And again, it, it it's a lot of political figures that would have something to say about Superman being a god or, you know, as they say in the film, he doesn't fear God. So themes of that was really prominent and really well woven into the film. <sighs> I saw what Zack Snyder was trying to do with certain characters, a la Lex Luthor and the whole kind of Mark Zuckerberg kind of uh, interpretation of the character, bigger than life, Elon Musk type of character. Jesse Eisenberg's a great actor, but uh, there are moments, there's moments in the performance. But overall, it, I will admit that that is the weakest element in the film for me is the portrayal of Lex Luthor. But the idea, the sentiment of him being behind everything, you know, it's 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 pieces, it's pieces there, but execution isn't all that great. But man, where do we begin with just seeing who I consider to be the best Batman, at least in the suit? Because I don't think Ben Affleck got a full chance to really portray his like Bruce Wayne of it all. Like I think he did a good job, but not as much as he did as a good job to me as Batman the most intimidating, the most fearful, scary looking, bulked up Frank Miller style Batman that we've ever seen on the live action this screen. This a big fan of the Batman that Ben Affleck portrayed. And I also like the continuation of kal -El's story. Again, kind of trying to find a balance between being the superhero that the world needs and being there, you know, and, and trying to implement himself into everyday society so i really enjoyed that narrative but then wonder woman getting into the mix was so fantastic the fight sequences especially our first standoff between batman and superman i always iconic line right tell me do you play? like i just love ben affleck's batman and jeremy irons as you know alfred and just there's so many just great things i love about the film again lex luther wasn't a big fan of the film takes a bit to find its momentum, especially in that first half. But once it hits the ground running, I think it's just a really well put together film. So with that being said, the Zack Snyder's version of BVS to me is uh, it's, it's, it's A minus to B tier. So I'm going to go ahead today. I'm feeling like giving it an A. So yes, again, it's a hot takes today. A lot of hot takes. But that is where I will place a BVS. Ooh, Suicide Squad, y'all. The Suicide Squad. And we're... 
what what went wrong? Well, um, as you all know, or maybe not know, uh, that don't you know have their ears to the ground with these films and it's a lot of behind the scenes. But there was a lot of behind the scenes issues with this movie with David Ayer making his film, making his version of the movie, and going back to like I mentioned BBS as far as like the promotion. That Suicide Squad trailer is still to date like top 10 trailers of all time in my eyes. I'm talking about the very first one and, and YouTube it right now. Go back and watch that trailer. It's almost, it's like, it's perfect. It's unfortunately not a good representation of what the film is, or at least what David Ayer wanted it to be, because unfortunately it was very much affected by studio interference. And, you know, if you guys don't know, the, the word on the street is that not a professional editor, a film editor, edited the film but a trailer company edited the final cut of suicide squad so that's why if you again i don't revisit this film a lot uh because i'm not a fan of it as you'll see where i'm going to put it here in a second but it is so choppy it is so it is it's not a well put together movie which is unfortunate because you can sure the story was a little bit thin even if we were to get the da david Ayers cut i don't think the story was going to blow our minds away it's a pretty simple premise when you look at the suicide squad as a group as a whole but the story you know i could i could put that aside it's just when you have a bad paced and just weirdly edited film it stands out like a sore thumb so it's just it's unfortunately not a well put together film and even with that, I can still look back on some of the positives. Like I mentioned, fire trailer. But as far as narratively and filmmaking wise and, and acting and characters, I think the two things that came out of this, not necessarily untouched, but two things that came out on the positives, probably Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn. I thought she was you know, pretty fun, pretty energetic, brought the foundation and the sensibilities of that character from the comics. And Will Smith's Deadshot. I think he really gave us a really good uh, Deadshot portrayal. So I think those two came out unscathed from that film. But everyone else, including <sighs> Method Actor, Academy Award winning actor, may I add, Jared Leto as a Joker, what the hell was that? <laughs> That's all I got to say there. But And again, for those that know about the David Ayer cut, apparently if the cut were to ever see the day of light, the only character to me that seems that would have benefited from his cut would have been Jared Leto's Joker. That's the only character I can see that probably would have benefited from getting his version of it because apparently there's a lot more meat to that bone because, Jesus, so the, the version of that Joker is just ridiculous, uh, straight ridiculous. But anyway, with that being said, man, I don't want to spend too much time on a film that I'm not a fan of, and that is, uh, that's a D-tier for me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Suicide Squad, D-tier, unfortunately. And, and listen, man, I feel so bad for David Ayer because he really had a good career going for him before coming into DC. And I love what he brought to, you know, being a writer of Training Day and a couple years, even before Suicide Squad, he had Fury, which was a fantastic war film with some great directing and great acting. But ever since 2016 Suicide Squad, David Ayer has not been the same director. Like, what was it? He, he came out with Bright, which was horrendous. Then you had um, The Tax Collector, I believe is the name of the film. It was him and Shia LaBeouf. That, oh my goodness, that movie is like, who? where is they, Where is David Ayer? Did he just, like, was, was this a fluke? Was this not the same? Who's the guy that made Training Day? Who's the guy that made Fury? He's MIA. So he hasn't been, unfortunately, his career has been really hindered and really put on the back burner and just kind of, I don't even know if he has anything in the works coming soon but i hope he does because i think he he is a good director but man the suicide squad really messed up his career but anyway let's move on to something that i think again I, as i said up top it's like you start off with b you know man of steel bbs hidden in my eye some really good interesting films with some really fantastic bigger than life characters and then you come all the way down from that mountain to the just to what we got with suicide squad but then leave it to the princess the amazonian warrior to save the DC universe. That's right, I said it. Wonder Woman 2017's Patty Jenkins, Gal Gadot, Chris Pine's Wonder Woman is a film that I think proved a lot of haters wrong. But man, when I think of Wonder Woman, this isn't no disrespect to the incredible Linda Carter and what she brought to that portrayal and just iconic in every way possible. But when I think of Wonder Woman, I think of Gal Gadot. Like, personally, I think of Gal Gadot. I think she embodies so much of what I love about Wonder Woman. Number one, badass Amazonian warrior. Uh, I think she captures that perfectly. And not to get too far into the weeds as far as conversation goes, but I think Zack Snyder really pulled that out of her. And, and not that Jetty, Patty Jenkins didn't, but I think Patty, what Patty Jenkins did perfectly, in my opinion, she, and, and it speaks to this film in general, she portrayed, which is the maybe Diana's most powerful attribute, and that's her compassion to humanity, right? So I think the 
that side of Diana was beautifully depicted by not only the direction and the writing and the performances, but also I thought that the fish out of water element of seeing her in, in the world uh, during that time. And I'll say it, man, when it comes to chemistry, not only does Chris Pride, as, as Steve Trevor, and Diana have the best chemistry in the DCEU and the DCU general in general, but I think they have one of the best romances of any comic book movie, and that goes for even Marvel projects. I Man, I think the chemistry between those two was beautiful. Uh, I love their journey. I think the pacing is really well done. Iconic moments, No Man Land is just such a beautiful scene in every way, and just seeing her just being again. When Patty did allow her to be a, a warrior, she really uh, portrayed those elements in that scene. My biggest issue with the film, I think the weakest part of the film is the third act. Once we get to that third act, it really kind of dropped the ball. There's moments in the third act, her going God mode on the on the soldiers, taking out Ares and all that stuff. But it's just like, and then also Steve Trevor's death in the moment uh, was very beautiful. But that third act really isn't, it's almost like a different movie than the first first half and the second half of this film. So with that being said, Elliot, where, where are you putting this movie? Wonder Woman 2017, ladies and gentlemen. It's an A for me, man. It's a beautiful film. I, I, I never forget seeing this in theaters. I saw it a couple times in theaters. And of course, if you all can see behind me, I own the film uh, right behind me there. It is unfortunate what happens a little bit later in another film. We'll talk about Wonder Woman and also maybe not seeing Patty Jenkins and, and Gal having a, uh, the Phyllis Year trilogy. But that 2017 film was just so beautiful. And it was groundbreaking too, right? The first kind of female-led uh, film. It beat Marvel to the punch for the first time in something. And it didn't, it did bonkers at the box office so uh wonder woman 2017 man is, is one of my favorite uh, dceu films and definitely one of my favorite films uh within the comic book genre so with that being said man we got four films on the list and we got s tier with man of steel we got a tier bvs and wonder woman and we got d tier all the way down the d's is a suicide squad it's uh it's, it's a roller coaster being a dceu fan again it's like man of steel bvs oh we ride on the high suicide squad tanking what is everyone doing fire everyone Wonder Woman saves the day, but then back to the pits of hell, and that is, for so many reasons, one of the most botched potential films ever, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is 2017's Justice League, or Justice League, however you want to call it. Oh, man, I don't even want to get into the weeds of it all, but, I mean, you talk about, again, Suicide Squad having interference, studio interference, but this film completely 180 of the characters and and again the whole idea of the people that be the powers that be was let's try to make a marvel movie let's try to make an mcu f movie with a guy that made two of the most profitable films during that time for marvel with josh josh whedon and uh, fire and ice water and vinegar it did not mix well and and again not getting to the whole josh whedon of it all as far as the separating the art from the artist he is a good writer he is a good director him as a human being is not that great but just focusing on the project and, and the, the artist side of it all. I want you all to think about this. A film that includes Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Cyborg, Aquaman. I think that film made less than a billion dollars is baffling. Absolutely baffling. That being said, I don't want to spend too much time on the negatives. If there was an F tier, that's where this film would lie. Right side by side by the Suicide Squad. Justice League, Joss Whedon's Justice League is just an absolute disgrace to This cinema. might be an, another hot take, man, but we get into 2018. We're talking about this man right here. My man, Aquaman, ladies and gentlemen. 2018 Aquaman, directed by James Wan, starring Jason Momoa, Nicole Kidman, and Amber Turd. <laughs> Willem Dafoe in a bunch of awesomeness, man. Listen, again, this is this might be a hot take, but I just have when I think of fun, I think of Aquaman. I think of it's it's a visually stimulating film. It is so gorgeous. You know, shout out to James Wan, what he was able to do with the underwater sequences. And I wouldn't be surprised to one of the goats, James Cameron, looked at Aquaman and be like, hey, that's pretty cool. Maybe we can apply that to you know the beautiful, wonderful Avatar Way of the Water, but beautifully stunning. It is a quintessential popcorn, shut that brain off before you even think about anything that's going on in the script. Shut it off. Just enjoy the colors because it's a very beautiful looking film. <laughs> Narratively speaking, it isn't like, 
you know, written with crayons. There, there is some heart to it. There is some emotion to it. There are some themes that are pretty, um, you know, strong, you know, family and never giving up and hope and being a king and Arthur's story, you know, taking himself out of this kind of mindset that he was in at the beginning to becoming a king at the end. There are moments of the film, narratively speaking, but the thing that I take away with Aquaman, it's just so much fun, man. Again, it's just like I said, I feel like I was a kid watching a Saturday morning cartoon, watching Aquaman fighting, you know, creatures and monsters, fighting his brother Orm, who I shout out to Patrick Wilson, who really hams it up as a villain, a really good villain too, if you ask me, not to levels of Zod. But definitely top tier as far as the DCEU quality goes. No, again, it's very cheesy. It's very corny. Not the best story. There are some really weird movie or music video moments of Aquaman and Mera coming out of the water with <laughs> Pitbull playing. It's pretty weird stuff going on. But, you know, it's, it's, it's some really standout moments. Like I said, visually striking scenes. But listen, I can't, I haven't met a person yet. And if I, if I meet them, you know, I have to look at them differently. The Trent scene in Aquaman is one of the coolest scenes of any superhero movie <laughs> in the last decade. That Trent scene, I, I beg you, even if you don't like the film or even if you haven't seen the film, just Google Aquaman 2018 Trent scene. It is just so, it's it's James Wan, number one. It's the James Wan of it all. It's a horror film within that like seven minute window of the storytelling. When they go in the trenches and they're going against the monsters, the visuals, the, the, them going down the pits of the trench, and it's like a, in the in the sound design. Oh man, I love that scene. Um, again, I'm a fan of this film. I have so much fun with it. You know, I'm gonna go ahead and put this on my my B tier, man. It's not A tier. I don't want to get too crazy. You know, I don't want y'all to think this is like a perfect movie for those that haven't seen it. But I just have. I think when I think of the word fun, I think of Aquaman, and I have a lot of fun. I revisit this one quite a few um, few times uh, every so often. And we're not talking about Aquaman 2. There's a lot of stuff going on with that one. Uh, and before I forget, too, another standout to me. Again, talk about hamming it up, cheesing it up. My man, Yaya Abdul Mateen II, his Black Manta was a lot of fun. So listen, man, Aquaman, my man. He's a B for me, man. I have so much fun with this film. But speaking of fun, man, let's talk about this this guy. Again, we're, we're, in, we're in rhythm again. We're like, God damn, what's going on with Suicide Squad? What is going on with Justice League? But Okay, Aquaman making the 1.1 billion that it made. I see you, just you know, I see you, DC. Let's talk about Shazam, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about Shazam, uh, directed by another horror director, David F. Sandberg, who uh, did some good things with Annabelle Creation and Lights Out. This film really surprised me, man. This is one of the biggest surprises to me in the DCEU, next to Wonder Woman, if I'm being honest with you, because again, it was just so much you know, negativity going around with the DC Universe after Suicide Squad. But man, when I tell you the heart, up until this point of the DCEU, I think this might have this film might have the most heart of any DCEU film up until this point of their slate of films, because the whole Billy Batson of it all, losing his mother, uh, not to death, but just her being selfish and not wanting to be there for Billy, that whole scene always gets me emotionally. Um, and then him finding family within the foster system. I love that family. I love the heart that it has. I love the themes that it portrays. And it's just a fun movie. Again, going back to Aquaman, I think of fun. I think of Shazam, man. The comedy works. I love how David F. Sandberg, like James Wan, was able to allow some of his horror sensibilities to come into this family fun film. Boardroom scene, they're eating the, the heads off. It's like, yeah, I love that stuff there. man. And Dr. Savannah. Another top tier underrated DCEU uh, villain, man. Up to Savannah was cool, man. I really enjoyed his narrative, his story, how it, you know, went against it was so parallel to Billy's story of losing a parent or having a, uh, his dad was so hard on him. If you saw the film, you know what happens to his dad and parallel that to what happened with Billy. So, this is a lot of good parallels. This is a really good film. My biggest issue is, you know, some of the, the suit paddedness of it all. It's like, can you just hit the gym up? You know, not body shaming, but come on, Zachary. Uh, I didn't like the suit. I didn't like, and this is something that we'll talk about later with my Shazam Fear of the Gods, and this is unfortunate, but the Billy Batson becoming Shazam and that disconnecting the character is just so baffling to me that Zachary Levi plays more of a child than Billy Batson plays more of a kid, right? But not goofy, right? But for some reason, Zachary Levi plays goofy to Billy Batson's more kind of subtleness. And again, knowing that the character is big, you know, Tom Hanks big in a superhero world, but it was just too goofy for me, man. It's like a huge disconnect between two actors. But that uh, is definitely something that stood out to me. Uh, but overall, like I said, when I think about fun, I think about Shazam and Aquaman. And, and those two films are just two of the more fun films. Films to me are just like bright, fun, colorful, good time. So 
that's where Shazam is for me as a B tier. So getting to on to a next film, and again, fun, right? It seems like they're just trying to have fun, right? And this is a film that I'll be honest, I don't revisit a lot, and that is <laughs> this title, man. Birds of Prey and the Fatapulous Macupation of One Harley Quinn, aka the film should have just been called Birds of Prey. Margot Robbie is just perfectly casted as Harley Quinn, and I really love the Birds of Prey. Journey, Journey uh, Smollett, I thought she was great as Black Canary. Uh, I really enjoy Mary Elizabeth Winston. I think she's Winstead, she's a fantastic actress. I really enjoyed her portrayal. I wish it was more of her, and I wish there was more Birds of Prey, right? Because they don't, they're only they're only a group only in the last like 10 minutes of the film. Everything else is them, you know, running around trying to find McGregor as Black Mask, great actor, of course, fantastic character in the comics. Not uh, the, the biggest fan of that portrayal of the character and what they did with the character. And, and um, this is just moments, you know, uh, of the film that it's like, oh, this is fun energy. It's the most like colorful version of Gotham that I've ever seen. Think of, I think more positively in the film than I do negatively, but it just doesn't have a long lasting effect to me. And it's not as memorable as some of these other films. And again, I don't revisit it as much as I do the other ones. So with that said, Birds of Prey to me. So we're going to put it at a C for me again. And it's not like on the lower end of a C. It's just like, it's just a, a, film, a film that you can have fun with, but I don't really revisit too often. And um, it was kind of one of those things that is in the DCEU, but but it's also kind of not in the DCU, so it was kind of in that weird space as well. But neither here nor there, it's a C for me. So Wonder Woman 1984, y'all. Again, we got pretty much this entire crew and cast from the first one coming back. Uh, even Steve Trevor found a way to come back. And first saw Wonder Woman 84, I was like, it's not bad. It's nowhere near as good as the first one. It's not bad. But then when you take off that those, those rose glasses and then you watch the film as a film, it's like, whoa, 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 what is... Patty, what's what's going on here? What what is going on, Patty? What, what is that the great story and the character arcs that we got in the first one? Why the hell is Steve Trevor back? Who and what is this Cheetah character that I know is a badass in the comics? What what have you done? This what is this? Oh, that Cheetah CGI was so abysmal. Oh my goodness. But narratively speaking, what are we doing with Wonder Woman eighty four? She's in modern times. She's lost Steve. She now is coming against, which I will say. One of the bright lights of that film is Maxwell Lord, played by the Pedro Pascal. What is good can be better. <laughs> he was really having it up. He uh, His story kind of fell apart. He like kind of became non-existent after the second half of the film. But he was a bright spot in that first half because it was a little bit like, what are we doing here, Patty? You get Steve in the mix. And even though the, it was a questionable decision, Trevor chemistry was still there it's still a strong point in the film and obviously they're doing the role reversal of him being new to the 80s and you know she's trying to implement him into the society or whatnot so it's kind of almost rehashing a lot of the familiar beats from the first one but it just doesn't achieve that magic from the first one and then again it's just like what are we trying to accomplish here and again the whole theme of like maxwell lore and, and the, the the mcguffin i can't even remember the mcguffin of it all that grants you wishes it's like what what is this disney channel movie that patty jenkins wrote it's abysmal and then pat and then again wonder woman is like non-aggressive in this movie she's like and again that is a, a thing that i love about wonder woman is her heart and her passion but like where's the warrior of where is the warrior existing like i don't even think wonder woman draws her sword in this film she has that stupid ass metal golden eagle which looks beautiful but it was only meant for selling toys because she literally wears it in one scene weird movie man this is a weird put together film this is all over the place totally all over the place um there's some great superhero heroic moments like i love the first flight moment kind of rehashing man of steel that we see with wonder woman flying in the, in the sky after she loses trevor and you know little easter eggs for wonder woman fans you know the visible jet well, there's moments but it's just nowhere near it's almost like there's complete it's almost like there was the same people from the first one on the second one but it's just like they were like shells of themselves and it's, this is a shell of a movie so it's, it's a c it's a low c like c minus 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 uh almost d tier knocking on the door but you know, it's, it's, it's Patty and Gal. And we're, we're, apparently we're never going to see him again. So it's not a good way to go out. But I, I have it at a very low C for me, uh, Wonder Woman 1984. Um, all right, y'all. So we were kind of rounding out here. And this is where, again, we're kind of like in a weird spot in the DC Universe in 2020. But then the big announcement comes. And it has been rumored for, at that point, four years. Zack Snyder's Justice League. Snyderverse. Ultimate Cut. His Cut. 
Is it ever coming out? Was it ever shot? Was it ever made? No, all the pundits, all the film uh, critics, all the, you know, TMZ, whoever, everyone was like, this film does not exist, which technically it didn't. Like it wasn't a complete film, but it was shot. Just wasn't edited and put together. You know, it was an assembly, right? It was just a rough edit. And oh my goodness, when they announced Zack Snyder's Justice League was coming to HBO Max, I was just so happy for him to get his his, his story out there, right? What an epic four-hour film, y'all. My goodness. And you talk about night and day. Whew, that Justice League versus this film doesn't even stand a chance, man, on so many levels. But, man, I'm so glad that Zack Snyder was able to tell his story. And, and part of this film is really was taken out of the movie in 2017 with – cyborg glory man and everything he brought to cyborg was beautiful it's a really good film man and again it is a little bit long the tooth obviously it's four hours and there are some some moments that could have been cut out for sure a lot of slow-mo from zach you know it's just that's just, just zach being zach because he loves cool man this looks cool right uh but no i love zach snyder man i really love this film and it's just a uh, beautiful beautiful story of this film is on a s tier for me y'all man Justice League, Zack Snyder, if uh, which I do believe this is the last time he'll ever direct a DC film, like ever. And if this is the, if that is to be factual, he went out on a high note, y'all. And that brings us to Mr. James Gunn's The Suicide Squad with an amazing cast. Not only does he bring back Margot Robbie as, you know, the incredible Harley Quinn, you know, Rick Flagg and uh, Jai Courtney, who's briefly in the film. But then he adds to the mix, you know, Idris Elba, John Cena and, you know, Shark King, Polka Dot Man, Ratcatcher 2. And it's just, man, this film, unfortunately, you know, not that money means everything, but financially this film did terrible. But of course we know why, because it was in the middle of the pandemic, but it was just such a a welcome return to the characters of the Suicide Squad, which I know, again, David Ayer didn't get his version of the story, but even with that aside, this was the best version. of This film, to me, just gives you even more proof that he just knows characters. He knows the D-list, F-list type of characters and can bring them into the forefront. I'm talking Polka Dot Man. I'm talking Rat Catcher 2. Like, what? Starro is the villain? <laughs> <laughs> he's a comic book head and, and it shows in this film, but also he's a human with a heart. And these characters had heart, man. That the story between the you know rat catcher and blood sport and how they had their connection, the you know, continuing Harley Quinn just being a, a wild card of a character, and, and I think to me is the best version of Harley Quinn we've seen in the live action format is James Wan's Margot Wabi's collaboration in that version of her. King Shark is a fantastic character. And, you know, the biggest surprise of it all to me is the peacemaker of it all, because honestly, to and obviously we're not talking about peacemaker in this ranking, but to have that character come out of that film and to, to give you such an interesting portrayal of this character was just so great. Amanda Waller is great in this film. Like everything that was done dirty in the first one was so redeemed in this kind of rendition and the suicide squad to me is definitely one of the best films in this franchise and it's it's up there for me at an a tier man uh the suicide squad by james gunn is uh, is a beautiful film and uh, all right ladies and gentlemen that brings us to most recently like literally like six months ago and that is the rocks the black adam the man in black ladies and gentlemen Look, man, I, again, we talked about it with Aquaman and, and the Birds of Prey and Shazam. This is another film that I that I personally had fun with. Now, I didn't have as much fun with this film as I did the other ones, but I did enjoy elements of this film. One that comes to mind, and yes, we'll get to the rock of it all, which I do think the rock was almost a gift and a curse within this franchise, more so a curse because it really kind of crumbled <laughs> beneath him for a lot of reasons, Superman being one of them, but... I like the what The Rock was able to bring to the role. Seeing him as Black Adam to me was not his best role, but it, it to me it proved that he could show you a different side of him. The part that really stole the film for me is the Justice Society of it all. Like big fan of those characters and really enjoyed what you know what we got with Hawkman. I thought that he was just so he was a badass. He was a superhero, man. Poster boy of what a superhero could be and should be. I love his back and forth with Black Adam in the film. You know. All this was great in that role. Pierce Brosnan, who should have been in a comic book movie years ago, right? He's, I really enjoyed what Pierce Brosnan brought to the role. Adam and 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 um, 
Adam Smasher and Cyclone were were they were wet behind the ears. Acting wise, you can tell they're kind of fresh, kind of new, and still learning some some ways to kind of really bring out them their best aspects as an actor. Then also the characters weren't really wit- written that well. They were kind of forgotten about throughout the narrative. So they they were kind of more the weaker parts. <sighs> the villain of it all uh, was pretty garbage if i'm being honest uh and, and the whole motivations of it all I did just have a good time just seeing superheroes fighting each other i right? know we, we now live in a time when that's just the standard is not enough for a lot of people uh because it's and understandably so inflation tickets prices aren't aren't you know cheap right so when you go to the theater you want to be more than just entertained and just you want to have more than fun you want to maybe you want to push the envelope right and this film didn't do that right that's why you know ultimately black adam is 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 kind of a seed tier for for me at the end of the day because you know we're we're in the the golden age of comic book movies and you have you know studios are not just saying i'm not paying attention to the narrative and paying attention to these characters like there are directors and writers and people that want to do justice to these characters and to have just a oh it was an okay film i had fun right it's just it doesn't it doesn't move the needle and this film did not move the needle but at the end of the day i had fun with the film uh sure there's a lot of potential left on the table a lot of stuff they could have did the whole shazam of it all the fact that you know and this is where again i love the rock he seems to be i would love to meet him one day he seems to be a very very awesome individual that you would love to have beers with or hang out with or just be around right but his ego definitely affected not only this film, but I think affects Shazam too that we'll talk about here in a second. And definitely left a sour taste in my mouth the way the handling of the whole Superman of it all, the marketing of it all, the pitching of like, hold on, you're going to fight Superman before you even fight Shazam. A lot, of, a lot of ego moves that I'm not the biggest fan that The Rock did. I appreciate what he was trying to do, at least from the sentiment of like, hey, you got Superman on the bench? Why? Right? Like that narrative was like, yeah, like, why <laughs> with the way he like used the henry cavill of it all to market the film kind of fourth quarter because the leading up to black adam and ultimately where it ended up making how much it ended up making is it's a disappointment fun but doesn't really do much for the genre of the superhero movies which again not every superhero movie has to be the best one but you have to at least again put enough effort in there that it's just not paint my numbers very formulaic at this point into the genre which brings us to the most recent DCEU film, which as I'm recording this on a Sunday, it's out now in theaters, and that is Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Um, as I mentioned in my review and as I mentioned on, on uh, most recent streams, and I did get the opportunity to see this all the way back in December. The only thing that was different with the cut that I saw versus the version that's out of the film now is they didn't have the post credit scenes, uh, which I won't talk about here because obviously it's still the weekend of. And I know some people still haven't seen it, so we won't spoil anything about the film. But as I said in my review, and I'll say it here, Again, it has some of the shades of what I loved about the first Shazam, the family elements, the kids, the heart, the uh, and all that stuff. It has bigger action, which sometimes bigger doesn't always mean better, but it is a bigger film in a sense of I love how they continue to build the magic of Shazam, which was something that was kind of absent in the first one. You know, they touch on his magical powers, but they really don't dive too deep into it, but they definitely dive more into, you know, the wizards of it all, the the magic of it all, the Greek mythology of it all, which I really had a fun time with. I know some people have been kind of criticizing the villains, uh, uh, Helen Mirren, Lucy Liu, I enjoyed them. Again, they kind of had shades of Zod of like them wanting, and again, not spoiling anything, both haven't seen it, but their purpose, their goal, what they were trying to do, you know, is something that, you know, you've seen before, but I enjoy what they were bringing to the table. And, and selfishly, I think they're two great actors, and I think they gave me more in the role than what was given to them on the script. Rachel Ziegler, I know a lot of people are kind of criticizing her, just kind of being flatlined, but I, I really enjoyed her chemistry with Freddie in the film. My issue with this movie, though, and again, you can watch my full review of it all, and it's my same issue I had with the first one, the disconnect between Billy Batson and him becoming Shazam is just like night and day. It's almost like Freddy is Shazam, and you know Billy Batson is just not the version of Shazam that we see, and I don't understand why Zachary Levi plays it that way, and I don't understand why David F. Sandberg, who's a very comparable director, very well you know he's well in the know of comic books i don't know why he doesn't address that disconnect between two actors it's very baffling and when you see the film again not giving too much away the story is very thin if i'm being honest with that's another criticism like this not it's not a the story is very been there done that but 
when you look at Billy Bass in this film, he's 18 years old. And the and to see Zachary Levi playing, playing like almost a younger version of him is just so weird. Like he doesn't, he seems like he's like a, the mind of a 13 year old in this film. And also, I mentioned how much I love like the family elements. The family is kind of forgotten about in the second film, and particularly Billy Batson's like really not existing in this movie. But also, like the the foster parents were great in the first one. They're really kind of put on the back burner. And the idea of the Shazam family, narratively, the film takes place four years after the first one, and they're supposed to be four years into them being heroes you would thought they were rookies. Like it, it made no sense that they, they didn't really, there was no growth from four years ago in Shazam to this new one. So again, it has its moments. It's great world building. Just some really cool visual effects. Uh, like I said, David F. Sandberg definitely had a bigger sandbox to play in visually, you know, and, and visual effects wise and, and all that stuff. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of shortcomings, which brings the, the most recent Shazam for me personally. <sighs> I have it kind of in that that C tier, B tier. I'm going to go ahead and put it at a C tier. So that is the list of how I would put the films, you know, from S, A, B, C, D. So let me go ahead and just rank them and uh, let y'all know how I would rank these films from how I would consider from the best to the worst. So I think I'm going to start with the low, down, dirty, which is the worst of the worst of the bunch. So the bottom of my list between the D list between Suicide Squad and Justice League, I have Suicide Squad being the worst out of the D list, as you've seen, as we talked about, um, you know why. So that that is where those films land to me. Getting to my C tier, it's going to go like this for me. It's going to go Wonder Woman at the bottom. Um, it's going to go Birds of Prey here. We're going to go, I think, Shazam. I had more fun with Shazam, and it's a better made film than Black Adam for me. So that's where my C tier is at. Going up to the B tier, I'm going to go, ooh, this is how I'm feeling on the day of the week. Better will put together film of Shazam over Aquaman. I have more fun with Aquaman, but as far as like a film and like cohesiveness and like an actual story, I'm going Shazam. Then we get to the A tier, and I'm looking at it like this, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, I might actually have to leave it the way it is, man. I know a lot of you all do not like Batman vs. Superman, but again, remember, I'm talking about the Zack Snyder version of it. It's going to be exactly the way you see it now, and that is uh, BBS, Wonder Woman, and The Suicide Squad for my A tier. And then going up to that, a, that S tier, that superior tier, is exactly what it looks like, which is Justice League, my, my second favorite DCEU film, and Man of Steel is my favorite DCEU film. So again, we'll go ahead and make it larger for you all can see. That is the list. That is it. That's how I would rank them. That's how I uh, would put them in my order. So big question is, how would you rank them? Go ahead and let me know in the comments how from your number one to number 13 and if you want to give me reasons why i would love to read them and respond to them but thank you all for watching the video uh, if you stuck around this point in the video thank you thank you thank you just a reminder to like share comment and subscribe to the channel the future is looking bright this is part of a full live stream discussion so if you guys want to see the full and length version of this video you can click that in the description of this video where we talk about the future of the dceu coming to an end the future of the dcu so check out that full video in the description of this video we'll catch you guys in the next one